Hello everybody and welcome back to another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion chapter 13 and probably 14 in one tape we are going to discuss here of the book Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. Chapter 13 is called Are Popes Infallible? Hour of the Truth th says no. We have learned so many things surely in the chapter before, the apostolic succession and all the other stuff, that we can for surety say popes are not infallible. So, because they are not infallible, they have to declare themselves infallible. Something that happened in 1870 at the First Vatican Council. But let's see and read and discuss what Rav Woodrow has to say to this. Are Popes Infallible? Adding to the many contradictions with which the Roman system was already plagued, as we read in previous chapters, there were Popes like the god Janus of olden times who began to claim infallibility. People naturally questioned how infallibility could be linked with the papal office when some of the popes had been very poor examples in morals and integrity. Yeah, I'm just pointing out to chapter 12, the one I read before this one, about the simony and adultery that all the popes committed in that time and still are committing in this time. And never to forget, instead of Rome, uh, instead of the word popes, you should read the word antichrist. The biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist, that's what the office of the papacy and with that every human person taking the chair of so-called Peter in Rome and calling himself Pope is the antichrist. And not some unknown person in the somewhere far away future. The Antichrist has been here for almost 2,000 years. Paul already said it, that the mystery of iniquity already works at his time, in the first century after the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. People naturally questioned how infallibility could be linked with the papal office when some of the popes had been very poor examples in morals and integrity. Well, at that time maybe people asked themselves these questions. Today they eat everything the Pope gives them out of a spoon and ask for more. And if the infallibility be applied only to doctrines pronounced by the Popes, how was it that some Popes had disagreed with other Popes? How was it that some Antichrists had disagreed with other Antichrists. Even a number of the Antichrists, including Virilinus, Innocent III, Clement IV, Gregory XI, Hadrian VI and Paul IV had rejected the doctrine of papal infallibility. Just how could all of this be explained in an acceptable manner and formulated into a dogma? Such was the task of the Vatican Council of 1870, that was by the way run by Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono as he is also known, the longest reigning Pope in the history of the papacy. The one who also put out the syllabus of errors where he condemned every human form of government as we know it today, democracy, republicanism, communism, fascism, whatever you want to call it, and they are all founded by the Jesuits. All these government forms that we have today, that I just summed up, actually come out of the feather of Jesuits. And of course they infiltrate them, and by that they are as controlled as the kings that were in the Middle Ages when the Pope controlled all the kings. Today the Jesuits control all the governments through their shadow government. And if you do not play along with the agenda of the Antichrist, you are not even in politics. Surely not in a position that you can achieve anything. 
always consider that when reading things like this here. So such was the task of the Vatican Council of 1870. The Council sought to narrow the meaning of infallibility down to a workable definition, applying such only to papal pronouncement made quote-unquote ex cathedra. The wording finally adopted was this. So what does ex cathedra mean? Quote, the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in the exercise of his office as pastor and teacher of all quote unquote Christians, eh? Roman Catholics read Christians in this case, he defines a doctrine of faith or morals to be held by the whole church is by reason of the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter. <coughs> we read about that, that he is not the successor of Peter, possessed of that infallibility, and consequently such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable, unquote. So whatever the Pope states on faith and morals and doctrine from his chair in Rome is infallible, is irreformable. He says that he is like God who cannot err because God never spoke a word and took it back. Every word God speaks, every word that comes out of the mouth of God is true. Every word that the Antichrist speaks is a lie. All of the problems were not solved by this wording. Nevertheless, papal infallibility became an official dogma on the Roman Catholic Church at the Vatican Council of 1870. Knowing the history of the popes, several Catholic bishops opposed making papal infallibility a dogma at the council. One of these, Bishop Joseph Strassmeyer, who lived between 1815 and 1905, is described in the Catholic Encyclopedia as, quote, one of the most notable opponents of papal infallibility." Unquote. He pointed out that some of the popes, antichrists, had opposed other popes, antichrists. Special mention was made of how Pope Stephen VI, who reigned between 896 and 897, brought former Pope Formosus, who reigned between 891 and 896, to trial. The famous story of one Antichrist bringing another to trial is one of sheer horror, for Antichrist Formosus had been dead for eight months. So what are you going to do with a body that is dead for eight months when you're in a Roman Catholic Church? Listen, nevertheless, the body was brought from the tomb and placed on a throne. There, before a group of bishops and cardinals, was the former Pope, dressed in the rich apparel of the papacy, a crown upon his loose scalp and the scepter of the holy office in the stiff fingers of his rotting hand. As the trial got underway, the stench of the dead body filled the assembly hall. Antichrist Stephen stepped forward and did the questioning. Yeah, of course, no answers were given to the charges by the dead man. So he was proven guilty as charged. With this, the bright robes were ripped from his body, the crown from his skull, the fingers used in bestowing the pontifical blessing were hacked off, and his body was thrown into the street. Behind a cart, the body was dragged through the streets of Rome and finally cast into the Tiber. Thus, one Antichrist condemned another. Then, a short time later, the Catholic Encyclopedia points out that, quote, the second successor of Stephen had the body of Formosus, which a monk had drawn from the Tiber, reinterred with full honors in St. Peter's. He furthermore annulled and assented the decisions of the court of Stephen VI and declared all orders conferred by Formosus valid. John IX confirmed these acts at two synods. On the other hand, Sergius III, who reigned between 904 and 911, you remember him from the previous chapter 12, he was mentioned there also, approved in a Roman synod the decisions of Stephen's synod against Formosus. 
Sergius and his party meted out severe treatment to the bishops consecrated by Formosus, who in turn had meanwhile conferred others on many other clerics, a policy which gave rise to the greatest confusion. Unquote. Such sharp disagreement between antichrists certainly argues against the idea of papal infallibility. Antichrist Honorius I, after his death, was announced as a heretic by the Sixth Council held in the year 860 AD. Antichrist Leo II confirmed his condemnation. If popes are infallible, how could one condemn another? Pope Vigilius, after condemning certain books, removed his condemnation, afterward condemned them again, and then retracted his condemnation, then condemned them again. Did you follow? He removed his condemnation, afterward condemned them again, and then retracted his condemnation, and then condemned them again. Where is infallibility here? Dueling, the author continues, was authorized by Antichrist Eugene III, who reigned between 1145 and 1153. Later Antichrist Julius II between 1503 and 1513, and Pope Pius VI between 1559 and 1565, forbade dueling. At one time in the 11th century, there were three rival popes, or Antichrists, all of which were disposed by the council convened by the Emperor Henry III. It's also something we read already in chapter 12, remember? Later in the same century, Clement III was opposed by Victor III and afterwards by Urban II. How could popes be infallible when they opposed each other? What is known as the Great Schism came in 1378 and lasted for 50 years. Italians elected Urban VI and the French cardinals chose Clement VII. Popes cursed each other year after year until a council disposed both and elected another. <laughs> so, <laughs> apostolic succession? Papal infallibility? Come on, Catholics, get a grip of your history. Pope Sixtus V had a version of the Bible prepared, which he declared to be authentic. Two years later, Pope Clement VIII declared that it was full of errors and ordered another to be made. Pope Gregory I repudiated the title of Universal Bishop as being profane, superstitious, haughty, and invented by the first apostate. Yet, through the centuries, other popes have claimed this title, Universal Bishop. The Pope still claims this title today. Antichrist Hadrian II, between 867 and 872, declared civil marriages to be valid, but Antichrist Pius VII, between 800 and 1823, condemned civil marriages as invalid. Antichrist Eugene IV, between 1431 and 1447, condemned Joan of Arc to be burned alive as a witch. Later, another Antichrist, Benedict IV, in 1919, declared her to be a saint. When we consider the hundreds of times and ways that popes have contradicted each other over the centuries, we can understand how the idea of papal infallibility is difficult for many people to accept. <laughs> I say... While it is true that most papal statements are not made within the narrow limits of the 1870 ex-cathedral definition, yet if popes have erred in so many other ways, how can we believe they are guaranteed a divine infallibility for a few moments, for a few blinks of an eye, if and when they should indeed decide to speak ex-cathedra, on morals and faith within the Roman Catholic Church, that is. They are fallible like every sinner on earth, but when they speak ex cathedra, they're infallible? Get a grip, people. 
Do you really believe this baloney? Popes have taken to themselves such titles as quote, Most Holy Lord, Chief of the Church in the World, Sovereign Pontiff of Bishops, High Priest, the Mouth of Jesus Christ, Vicar of Christ, and even other titles. Said Antichrist Leo XIII on June 20th, 1894, quote, We hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. Unquote. Blasphemy in its purest form. And didn't the scribes and Pharisees wanted to stone Jesus because he claimed to be God? What happened to that so-called succession of Jesus Christ when they do the same thing? With Jesus it was no blasphemy because he was the Son of God. He is the Son of God still. But the Popes never were. They are antichrists. We hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. Yeah, which God do you hold the place on earth of? The God of this world. Satan, the deceiver, the man of perdition. That's the one whose place on earth you hold, you Antichrist popes. During the Vatican Council of 1870 on January 9th, it was proclaimed, quote, The Pope is Christ in office, Christ in jurisdiction and power. We bow down before thy voice, O pious, yeah, Pope Pius the Ninth, as before the voice of Christ, the God of truth, in clinging to thee, we cling to Christ. Unquote. So much blasphemy in this little sentence that I don't even want to address it. But you get the notion, right? But the historical sketch that we have given plainly shows that the Pope is not Christ in office, or in any other way. The contrast is apparent. The very expensive crowns worn by the popes have cost millions of dollars. Jesus, during his earthly life, wore no crown except the crown of thorns that was put upon his head. The pope is waited on by servants. What a contrast to the lowly Nazarene who came not to be ministered to, but to minister. The popes dress in garments that are very elaborate and costly, patterned after those of the Roman emperors of S.U.N. sun worship days. The immorality of many of the popes, especially in past centuries, stands in striking contrast to the Christ who is perfect in holiness and purity. In the view of these things, we believe, I think that you are with me here and say, yeah, I believe that too, the claim that the Pope is the Vicar of Christ is without any basis in fact. Well, you could call it a conspiracy theory, because there's no fact behind that. That he calls himself Vicar of Christ, that is a fact. That he is the Vicar of Christ is a lie, except you understand the mental reservation that he is the placeholder of Satan. As early as the year 1612 it was pointed out, as Andreas Helwig did in his book Roman Antichrist, that the title Vicar of Christ has a numerical value of 666. Written as Vicar of the Son of God, in Latin Vicarius Filii Dei, the letters with numerical value are these. I equals 1 used six times. L equals 50, V equals 5, C equals 100 and D equals 500. When these are all counted up, their total is 603 score and 6. This number reminds us, of course, of Revelation 13, 18, where we read, quote, Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 
and this number 603 score and 6. Unquote. It should be pointed out in all fairness, however, that numerous names and titles, depending on how they are written or which language is used, can produce this number. The examples given here will be of special interest because they are all linked with Rome and with Roman Catholicism. According to Alexander Hislop, who wrote the book The Two Babylons, the original name of Rome was Saturnia, meaning the city of Saturn. Saturn was the secret name revealed only to the initiates, that is the esoteric knowledge of the Chaldean mysteries, which in Chaldea was spelled with four letters, S-T-U-R, STUR. In this language S was 60, T 400, U 6 and R was 200. 60, 400, 6 and 200, a total of 600, 3 score and 6. Nero Caesar was one of the greatest persecutors of Christians and emperor of Rome at the height of its power. His name, when written in Hebrew letters, equals 600, 3 score and 6. The Greek letters to the word Latinos, meaning Latin, the historical language of Rome, a dead language by the way for a dead god, or the god of death, in all its official acts amount to 603 score and 6. In Greek, we are looking at Latinos now, L is 30, A is 1, T is 300, E is 5, I is 10, N is 50, O is 70, and S is 200. So, 3, 1, 300, 5, 10, 50, 70, and 200 equals 600, 3 score, and 6. This was pointed out by Iranius as early as the 3rd century. So already in the 3rd century the people could see from the titles the popes, the so-called infallible vicar of Christ, held on this earth, that this mounted up to the 666 of the book of Revelation that John wrote on the island of Patmos. The same word also means Latin man, and is but the Greek form of the name Romulus, from which the city of Rome is named. This name in Hebrew, Romeith, also totals, you guessed it, 603 score and 6. Unlike the Greeks and Hebrews, the Romans did not use all letters of the alphabet for numbers. They used only six letters. D, C, L, X, V and I, standing for 500, 150, 10, 5 and 1. All other numbers were made up of a combination of these. And therefore you have to understand that the letter M, that has now come to be used also as a Roman numeral representing 1000. But as E. W. Bullinger points out in his book Numbers in Scripture, on page 284, 1000 was originally written as CI, with another C turned around, that is CI and C turned around. And this was later simplified into the sign that you can see here in the picture and the video, and finally written as an M. Of course, when you look at that CI and the C on the other way around, it looks like an M, almost like the M of McDonald's, right? <laughs> It is interesting and perhaps significant that the six letters which make up the Roman numeral system when added together totally exactly 666. Let's do the math. D 500, C 100 is 600, L 50 is 650, X 10 is 660, V 5 is 665 and I 1 is 666. Turning to the Bible itself, in the Old Testament we read that King Solomon each year received 603 score 6 talents of gold, as we can read in 1 Kings 10 verse 14. Quote, 
Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Unquote. This wealth played an important part in the leading him in leading him astray. In the New Testament, the letters of the Greek word euporia, from which the word wealth is translated, total six hundred three score and six. Out of all the two thousand Greek nouns of the New Testament, there is only one other word that has this numerical value. Now, that word paradosis, translated, means tradition, as we can read in Acts 19.25 and Matthew 15, verse 2. Quote, from Acts, quote, whom ye called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Unquote. And as we can read in Matthew chapter 15, verse 2, quote, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Unquote. So, wealth and tradition. Interestingly enough, were the two great corruptors of the Roman Catholic Church. Those are not only the two corruptors of the Roman Catholic Church, those are the pillars, especially tradition, on which the Roman Catholic Church is built. The tradition that comes actually out of Babylon. So, are we really speaking of infallible popes here? Of infallible men? Yeah, because the church says so, that is so. You are not to question the Antichrist. You are not to question the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. You only have to obey or else. We continue in chapter 14. The Roman Catholic Unholy Inquisition a very, very important part of this book. And everybody who has maybe not yet heard of it, I ask to turn to Acts and Monuments, or what is also known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. Here we have a little excerpt of the Inquisition, and I can only advise you to go to the readings that Tom Frest did on the wonderful book from Henry Gretton Guinness, called Romanism and the Reformation. When he came to the part of the Inquisition, in that part of the book of Romanism and the Reformation, it sent shivers down my spine, and you will not be able to eat while reading Fox's Book of Martyrs. I can assure you that. The Roman Catholic Unholy Inquisition so openly corrupt that the fallen church become in the Middle Ages, we can readily understand why in many places men rose up in protest. Many were those nobles, many were those noble souls who rejected the false claims of the Pope, looking instead to the Lord Jesus for salvation and truth. Well, all these people were called heretics and were bitterly persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church throughout the ages, not only with the Holy Inquisition, but before and still today, where the Holy Inquisition has just taken up another name and calls itself the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, of which Pope Benedict XVI's predecessor of Antichrist Francis I was the head of. We have a quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, One of the documents that ordered such persecutions was in the inhuman Ad Extirpanda, issued by Pope Innocent IV in 1252. Not so innocent as his name supposed to be. The document stated that heretics were to be, quote, crushed like venomous snakes, unquote. It formally approved the use of torture. Civil authorities were ordered to burn heretics. Unquote. 
the aforesaid bull at Exterpanda remained thenceforth a fundamental document of the Inquisition, renewed or reinforced by several Antichrists, Alexander IV between 1254 and 1261, Clement IV between 1265 and 1268, Nicholas IV between 1288 and 1292, and Boniface VIII between 1294 and 1303, and others. And don't forget, Boniface VIII, who said in Unam Sanctam, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. The civil authorities, the author continues, therefore were enjoined by the popes or antichrists under pain of excommunication to execute the legal sentences that condemned impenitent heretics to the stake. Well, the civil authorities were enjoined by popes under pain of excommunication. Those people who really think that excommunication is something bad. I can receive no greater honor from the Antichrist in Rome than to be excommunicated out of the Church of Satan and be liberated into the body of Christ. It is to be noted, the author continues, that excommunication itself was no trifle, for if the person excommunicated did not free himself from the excommunication within a year, he was held by the legislation of that period to be a heretic and incurred all the penalties that affected heresy." Unquote. Now, men pondered long in those days on how they could devise methods that would produce the most torture and pain. Oh, I can tell you, the human mind is so inventious when it comes to torturing other people. You can not believe it. And we will a little bit later speak about the Spanish boots. And I will include just one search link of pictures. Just when you enter in Google Pictures, Spanish boots. The pictures that you see there are abominable. It is almost beyond comprehension. We, true Bible-believing Christians, loving people, have no idea what the sick minds that are processed with the mind of Cain can invent to bring torture and pain to all those people who do not agree with the teachings of the so-called infallible Antichrist in Rome. Men pondered long in those days on how they could devise methods that would produce the most torture and pain. One of the most popular methods was the use of the rack, a long table on which the accused was tied by the hands and feet, back down, and stretched by rope and windlass. This process dislocated joints and caused great pain. Heavy pinchers were used to tear out fingernails or were applied to red hot to sensitive parts of the body. Rollers with sharp knife blades and spikes were used over which the heretics were rolled back and forth. There was the thumb screw, an instrument made for disarticulating fingers and Spanish boots which were used to crush the legs and feet. The iron virgin was a hollow instrument the size and figure of a woman. Knives were arranged in such a way and under such pressure that the accused were lacerated in its deadly embrace. This torture device was sprayed with holy water and inscribed with the Latin words meaning glory only to God. Well, this device was sprayed with holy water. I see that I can put a picture in here. I think that is on the page of the Spanish boots, the link that I will provide in the description box of the video, where you can see that one part is opened and then there is put 
not only hot water in there, holy water, no, 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 liquid metal and liquid boiling oil, and then sprinkled above the person who is in that iron virgin at that moment. So not that the knives aren't pain enough, we also have to sprinkle these with so-called holy water. Glory be only to God. Yeah, what God can take glory out of torturing innocent Bible-believing Christians? Huh? The God of the Bible? I don't think so. Victims, after being stripped of their clothing, had their arms tied behind their backs with a hard cord. Weights are attached to their feet. The actions of the poly suspended them in mid-air or dropped and raised them with a jerk, dislocating joints of the body. While such torture was being employed, priests holding up crosses would attempt to get the heretics to recant. Protestant persuasion was apprehended and condemned to death by the sentence of Milan. At the place of execution, a monk presented a cross to him, to whom Gamba said, quote, My mind is so full of the real merits and goodness of Christ that I want not a piece of senseless stick to put me in mind of him. Unquote. For this expression, his tongue was bored through, and afterwards he was burned. Some who rejected the teachings of the Roman Church had molten lead poured into their ears and mouths. Eyes were gouged out and others were cruelly beaten with whips. Some were forced to jump from cliffs onto long spikes fixed below where, quivering from pain, they slowly died. Others were choked to death with mangled pieces of their own bodies with urine and excrement. At night, the victims of the Inquisition were chained closely to the floor or wall where they were at helpless prey to the rats and vermin that populated those bloody torture chambers. The religious intolerance that prompted the Inquisition caused wars which involved entire cities. In 1209 AD, the city of Béziers was taken by men who had been promised by the Pope that by engaging in the crusade against heretics, they would at death bypass purgatory and immediately enter heaven. Sixty thousand, it is reported, in this city perished by the sword, while blood flowed in the streets. At Lavore, in 1211, the governor was hanged on a gibbet, and his wife thrown into a well and crushed with stones. Four hundred people in this town were burned alive. The crusaders attended high mass in the morning, then proceeded to take other towns of the area. In this siege, it is estimated that one hundred thousand Albigenses fell in one day. Their bodies were heaped together and burned. At the massacre of Merindol, five hundred women were locked in a barn which was set on fire. If any leaped from windows, they were, they were received on the points of spears. Women were openly and pitifully violated. Children were murdered before their parents who were powerless to protect them. Can you imagine your child being murdered in front of your sight and you cannot even move a finger to help your child? which has not even yet committed any crime of heresy because it's a child and children do not have the knowledge of the Bible yet and have not yet the knowledge of repentance and sin and were murdered in front of the parents who were powerless to protect them. Can you imagine that with your own child? Well, I tell you one thing, these times are coming again, because it is written that the children will turn against their parents. Some people were hurled from cliffs of stripped of clothing and dragged through the streets. 
Similar methods were used in the Massacre of Orange in 1562. The Italian army was sent by Antichrist Pius IV and commanded to slay men, women and children. The command was carried out with terrible cruelty, the people being exposed to shame and torture of every description. Then 10,000 Huguenots, which were Protestants, were killed in the bloody massacre in Paris on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. The French king went to Mass to return solemn thanks that so many heretics were slain. The French king went to Mass to return solemn thanks that so many heretics, men, women and children were slain. The papal court received the news with great rejoicing and Antichrist Gregory VIII in grand procession went to the church of St. Louis to give thanks. He ordered the papal mint to make coins commemorating this event. The coins showed an angel with sword in one hand and a cross in the other before whom a band of Huguenots with horror on their faces were fleeing. The words Ogonotorum Strangis, 1572, meaning the slaughter of the Huguenots, 1572, appeared on the coins, and I will put a picture of that coin in the video right here. An adjoining illustration from Ritpa's History of the World shows the work of the Inquisition in Holland. A Protestant man is hanging by his feet in stocks. The fire is heating a poker to brand him and blind his eyes. Some of the popes that today are acclaimed as quote-unquote great lived and thrived during those days. Especially the days between 1203 and 1805, as you can listen to in the song the torture or the inquisition song that I start my broadcasts on Hour of the Truth with. Why didn't they open the dungeon doors and quench the murderous fires that blackened the skies of Europe for centuries? If the selling of indulgences or a superstitious worship, as we can read in the Royal Declaration of page 102, of statues, the immorality of some popes, if these can be explained as abuses and excused because they were done contrary to the official laws of the Church, what can be said about the Inquisition? It cannot be explained away as easily, for the fact remains the Inquisition was ordered and still is ordered by papal decree and confirmed by Antichrist after Antichrist. Can we believe that such actions were representative of him who said to turn the cheek, to forgive our enemies and to do good to them that despitefully use and hate us? Well, this is how contrary the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ is over the teaching of Antichrist. Do your own research into these history facts that you will not be taught in any public or even private school that you go to. And that is how they get you. They make the civil system Roman Catholic through applying Roman Catholic law to your civil law and my civil law and we are all raised Roman Catholic without even understanding it. The Inquisition. Not something lost in the Dark Ages, but transported into our time by modern wars. The First and the Second World War, which only were one war with a 20-year truth in between it, was nothing else than inquisitorial anti-reformation, counter-reformation, inquisition, war. One war. And Vietnam 
when you read the book Vietnam, Why Did We Go by Avril Manhattan was just the same thing, to overthrow the Buddhists. And the war that we have today, the so-called war on terror against the Islamic states, is nothing else than an inquisition. Where the dead soldiers on both sides further are just a gain for the Roman Catholic Antichrist agenda. He kills friends and foes at the same time because the end justifies the means. Meaning if the end is good, all means to achieve this end are allowed and good and of virtue. Bribery, rape, murder, torture, war, deception, lie, indoctrination, whatever means are necessary to achieve a goal for the Roman Catholic Church is honorable because in the end the Church is the gainer and the end justifies the means. That is the Roman Papal Antichrist Satanic Diabolical System that I am exposing not only with reading this book from Ralph Woodrow, Babylon Mystery Religion, but with all my work that I do on my YouTube channel. And as long as I still have a breath in my body, you will hear me pronouncing the Pope the Biblical, Historical and Prophetic Antichrist. I am not here to make friends. I am here to wake people up to the deception they have been living in and raised in all their lives. From cradle to grave we are lied to and not told the truth. Until one moment, God claps on your shoulder and says, Hey, wake up. I got some truth for you. And then you have the possibility to turn to the 1611 King James Bible and see the truth for the first time in your life with your own eyes. And when you honestly turn to that wonderful holy book, you will see how betrayed and brainwashed and indoctrinated you and everyone around you has been all your life. And then you have to make a choice. You can either choose Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who rescued us by shedding his own blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And by accepting him and believing in him and following his commandments, all ten of them, you can achieve eternal life. Because you are made righteous through the grace of God, which is a gift and the faith in Jesus Christ alone. Or you can join the side of the Inquisitors, of the Antichrist, you can take the mark of Cain and you can have a, what most people would say, wonderful life in this earth. Lots of money, lots of women, lots of sins. But at the day of reckoning, at the day of judgment, you will be judged after your thoughts and after your deeds. And you will not be part of the first, but will be part of the second resurrection for judgment and be thrown into fire. And eventually your life will cease to exist. You're dead forever. Do you want to be dead forever or do you want to live forever? That is the choice that every one of us has and should make. Whether you're aware of it or not, the war 
that started in heaven is taking place on the earth. Isaiah 14 I will exalt myself above the throne of the Most High, Lucifer said, and started a war in heaven, and he was cast out, and with him a third of the angels who followed him, and they were cast out to the earth. Where here today we have two kinds of people on the earth. We have the ones who are eagerly following the word of our Lord and Master, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Jesus Christ and want to do His will and His bidding. And you have the people who have the other spirit, the spirit of Satan. It's a spiritual war because we are not fighting against flesh and bones but against powers and authorities in high places. It's a spiritual war that is fought right under our nose here on earth in the flesh to give us a spiritual reward, eternal life through Jesus Christ who came to redeem us and through his spilled blood we can be washed righteous in front of him. It's your choice. Do you want these few years on this earth to be pleasant? Or do you want the few years on this earth less pleasant and therefore have eternal life? That's a choice every one of us has to make at some point in life. And this choice is so much easier when you know, when you are aware of all the lies that you have been told through the Roman Catholic Church, through the Antichrist system. And when you see how they applied the different torture methods throughout the ages, still until today, with their roaring wars all over the world and rumors of wars and fear indoctrinating into you that only you cling to this life. But when you cling to this life, what did Jesus say? Whoever loves his life will lose it and who hates his life will gain it. Okay, chapter 13 and 14 of Babylon Mystery Religion and a little personal rant I had to get rid of at the end is done. So, until next time, I thank you all for listening and watching, and God bless you. Until then, Jogla66 on Hour of the Truth, signing off. Bye-bye. This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God by the believing people who have hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie 
with 50 million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up another way a counterfeit a compromise beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their lord recall their memory to say by the same faith we live today